Hello, I'm Robert Moynihan, and I'm here in Budapest, Hungary, on the 3rd of November, with the great privilege of speaking with Your Eminence, Alarion Alfeyev. Thank you for this opportunity to speak with you. Thank you for coming. Today is November 3rd. It is the feast of one Saint Hilarion in the Orthodox tradition, and so I would like to congratulate you on this occasion. Thank you. Um, we have known each other for just about 24 years. We met in 1999. My mind goes back to a snowy evening in Moscow when a Catholic church was dedicated and a small delegation came from the Russian Orthodox Church and you were with that delegation. Do you remember that time? I vaguely remember that time. So over the years, we've collaborated together in different ways. In one central theme was always the restoration of faith, not only in Russia in the post-Soviet time, but also in the West, which seems to have in many ways lost its traditional faith. So we worked together on concerts having to do with religious themes, the Passion of St. Matthew, the Christmas Oratorio, and some of the dialogues between Catholic bishops and Orthodox bishops. But in this conversation, I wanted to go back to the very root of the question. Is there a kind of tragic forgetfulness of modern man, particularly in the West, of the true nature of his life, his soul, his destiny? And is this the cause of many grave problems in our time? I grew up in the Soviet Union, which was uh, an atheist empire. There was uh, an official proclamation of atheism, and the believers were considered as uh, the people of the second class, of the second sort. The church lived in a sort of ghetto, and uh, from the very beginning of the school education, children were taught that there is no God. Darwin was uh, the one who explained the origin of the universe and the origins of the humankind. And basically it was uh, taken for granted and it was imposed on everyone. At that time, uh, we believed that uh, the true freedom of religion exists in the West and that it is in the West that uh, most of the people believe in God and it is from the West that we received some of the forbidden literature, mm -hmm. such as the Bible, the New Testament, the writings of the Church Fathers, the writings of the theologians of the Russian immigration, the literature produced by Russian religious philosophers. All of this uh, was either printed in Samizdat or it came from the West. Mm -hmm. Now the situation seems to have changed completely. Mm -hmm. Now we see a very different picture in the West. We see uh, empty churches. We see a uh, decline of uh, religion in uh, some countries, which uh, until very recently were considered as uh, traditionally Christian. While in my country, we see the resurgence of faith. Mm. On your, in your own personal life, can you just speak about your parents and how you passed through the threshold into faith, also in either, either cooperation with them or perhaps even in some type of rebellion against them? I don't know the answer. It was my mother who converted to the Orthodox faith uh, after a long search for truth. She was reading um, Russian religious philosophy, she was reading uh, Plotinus, she was uh, reading some uh, Indian books, and then she came to the Orthodox faith. 
and I was baptized when I was uh, 11 years old. Mm -hmm. And from that very moment, I became very attracted by uh, the church, by the church service especially. And uh, when I turned 15, I think uh, it was obvious for me that uh, it is the church that I want to dedicate my life to. I see. Now, I did come across a book that your mother wrote, Pilgrimage to Jivari. Is that, and that deeply moved me. I thought, this is a beautiful book. And it describes a mother and her son visiting a monastery in Georgia. And I believe it's a true account of a trip you made. When was that trip? What happened on that trip? And can you just give some memory of what went through? You were about 15 years old. What went through your mind and heart on that trip? It was one of the turning points uh, in my personal spiritual development because uh, it was exactly the time when I started to consider uh, monastic life. Mm. And it was very important for me to encounter uh, living monks. Uh, in the Russian Orthodox Church, at that time, there were only five male monasteries for the entire Russian Orthodox Church. But in Georgia, uh, there were few uh, very small monastic centers, and one of them is described in the book uh, written by my mother. Uh, Jvari is uh, not the name of uh, the monastery which we visited, it's the name of another place, which is now a monastery. At that time it was just an architectural monument, it was a famous church. But the uh, monastery which we visited uh, made a very deep impression on me. Uh, there were uh, just a few monks, one uh, very impressive abbot who is described very realistically in my mother's book. And uh, he spoke to me about monastic life. And he was one of those who um, kindled this uh, flame of... Uh, interest in monastic life, which brought me to the monastery. What could be interesting for a 15-year-old, rather than fame as a musician or making money, what attracted you to the very quiet, off-the-stage off life of a monk? I was uh, never interested in making money. I was interested in music but not because it was my choice, it was uh, my parents' choice. They decided that I should study music because uh, at a very early age, uh, it was discovered that I have uh, a perfect pitch and that I have some um, abilities for the music. So I started music education and I had to play violin at least three hours per day. This was the norm which I had to fulfill. And uh, to be honest, I didn't like it. So on the one hand, uh, music is still a very important part of my uh, life. Uh, and it was the, uh, so to speak, the constitutive uh, element of my childhood and youth. Three hours a day. Three hours a day. It's only uh, practicing violin, but I also had to learn music, I had to listen to music, I had to study um, uh, works of different composers. And from the age of um, 11 or 12, I started lessons of composition with a professional composer. So uh, the original intention was that I should become either a violinist uh, or a composer. But uh, at the age of 15, as I said, I became more and more attractive by the church. And I realized that this is my life, not, me, not the music. But what, what, what was the precise thing that attracted you? I think it's the grace of God. I think it's uh, the vocation which uh, someone just uh, hears very strongly in his uh, conscience, in his heart. And uh, it came mostly uh, through the divine services, not so much through the reading. It came mostly through the participation in the divine services. Uh, 
It was the time when uh, young people were not allowed in the altar. But there were a few exceptions, and I was one of uh, those exceptions which was made. And it was for me a very important step that I was allowed uh, in the altar. I became an altar boy, I became a reader in the church, I read the Psalms, I read the uh, Holy Scripture. And this uh, was a great experience for me. Well, just to make a full disclosure, in my own life, I was an altar boy in the Roman Catholic Church, even at the time of using Latin. So my memory goes back to that, and I have my memory of the first liturgy that I had the privilege to attend in the Eastern Rite in Russia, and this sense of Lord have mercy, if I recall Gospodin Palmilno. And the very fact of speaking to a Lord, to someone whom we adore, who draws us to a higher goal than some earthly soccer star or music star or the Beatles or Bill Gates, and asking for mercy so that we may become united, healed, this is a rebellion against a humanistic worldview. It's viewing eternity in some way. It's viewing the personal soul as on a long journey. In some way, I'm wondering, was there a rebellion against this teaching in the Soviet time of materialism, humanism, Darwinism? Was this what attracted you? Obviously, there was a rebellion, but it wasn't out of rebellion that I became a monk, finally. Because uh, it was the uh, vocation, and it was very clear to me that I uh, want to dedicate my life to God rather than to music. And the choice was between the two. Th there were no other options for me. Uh, <clears throat> So at the age of 20, when I finished my military service, uh, instead of returning to the Moscow Conservatory, which I entered before the military service, I went straight to a monastery. Uh, and this is how I uh, quit musical life and uh, began my monastic life. We did skip over some aspects of the 1980s. Uh, in that time, in the conservatory, you formed a friendship with a man I later met who was a conductor at your church and also for the orchestra at your concerts, Alexei Putsakov. Can you speak of your friendship? Well, we were introduced to each other by my spiritual father, uh, who was a priest in the church, in which much later I would become uh, a rector of this church. And he knew me and he knew him. And we were of the same age. We studied in different schools. And he told me that uh, there is a boy whom you should meet. And then he introduced us to each other. And Alexei was a very uh, talented person who uh, had no musical education, but who um, sang in the choir, and he became uh, a disciple of a very famous Moscow choir conductor. And through this discipleship, he learned the art of conducting, and he became by now uh, one of the leading choir conductors in Russia. Yeah. Not even by now, but quite a long ago. He was very young when he started to conduct big professional choirs. And in some way, your friendship was en enriching to you too, I believe, it gave you the sense, even though you had become a monk, that you should continue in some way your composition and your, your musical life. Not really, at least for uh, the 20 years which passed from my monastic tonsure to the time when I uh, restarted to compose music. But when I restarted to compose music, it was Alexei who was the very first person to listen to what I composed. And I was in Vienna at that time, he was in Moscow. Mm -hmm. So once I would compose a piece, for example, one of the 
uh, parts of St. Matthew Passion. I would call him by phone. It was not uh, a mobile phone at that time, it was a landline. So I would call him and I would play this piece to him and he would listen on the other end and give his comments. Well, we have just spoken of a period from about 1985, when you were nearly 20, to 2005 or 2006. 20 years passed, you entered religious life, you became a monk, you gave up the life of a violinist and a composer, and then you slowly, after becoming a priest and then even a bishop, you had this return to music. But during those 20 years, the Soviet Union came to an end. And the question arose, what would the, be the role of the church in a post-Soviet Russia? I'm interested in that question because in the West, we have a great debate. It, what is the nature of the Russian soul? What is the nature of religious faith in Russia? What is the connection between Russia post-Soviet and pre-Soviet? I wondered if you could reflect on that for a moment. First of all, I would like to say that uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union was uh, a turning point uh, for me personally and also for my church. Though I should say that the resurrection of the church started a couple of years earlier. It started actually in uh, 1988 when the church celebrated the millennium of the baptism of Russia. And this celebration somehow coincided with the period of uh, Gorbachev's reforms, uh, when he initiated the freedom of speech, it was called glasnost, which means uh, uh, that you can speak freely. Mm. And then uh, another process which he initiated was called uh, perestroika, which meant uh, resetting, rebuilding. Resetting. But his idea was to reset the Soviet Union, but it was uh, not possible to reset it. So finally it led to its collapse. But what was important for uh, all of us, the believers, is that uh, the freedom of belief, the freedom of religion, uh, was not only declared, but it started to be implemented. And immediately, the church went out of the catacombs, out of uh, its ghetto in which it had existed for 70 years. Immediately new churches started to be built and there were huge numbers of people who uh, came to be baptized. One priest in Moscow could baptize uh, 300 people per day. All right. This actually crosses into my own life. I was in Rome in the late 1980s, and we spoke of glasnost, perestroika. As an American, I had this concept of the red Russia coming into Europe, attacking America. It was the way we saw things. And I met Frank Shakespeare, who was the ambassador of the United States to the Vatican, and I had an interview with him, and he says, Gorby does not have a chance to have perestroika transform, keep the communist system, but open it just a bit. He said, no, no, it will all change. And I was there when Mikhail Gorbachev arrived in December 1st, 1989, Cortile San I can still see the limousine. Raisa gets out of the car. Mikhail Gorbachev gets out. They go to the elevator. They see John Paul II, the second. And we all thought, a time of peace is coming, a time of peace. Now, the West, in some way, in my mind, has missed the opportunity of the entire last 33 years. And so this coincides with my adult life. Our collaboration was an attempt to make this peaceful world of post-Soviet respectful also of everything that was suffered in the past, both in the West and in the Soviet Union, but to build a better, more deep, more, more just world. So the 90s passed by, I visited Russia and I saw a great poverty and I felt what is, what's happening. And I also saw some of this religious renaissance. But, uh, and one of my uh, contacts was also Pope Benedict XVI, who very much wished 
to have this kind of dialogue, mutual respect, fraternal friendship. And uh, you watched this period pass by the 90s and into the 2000s, and uh, you went to Oxford, you saw the West. So some reflection on this post-Soviet time filled with hope, and yet some of the hopes were dashed. There are many people in Russia nowadays who believe that the collapse of the Soviet Union was a great tragedy. I do not share this belief. I think it was a providential event. I think it was a gift of God to all of us that the atheist empire collapsed. Not that the country was uh, split into different countries. And indeed, there were many painful experiences for uh, those people who lived in these newly created countries where many conflicts started. So it was a painful experience. But the very fact that the official atheism came to an end together with the collapse of the Soviet Empire was indeed a turning and crucial point for the church, for religion, for the freedom of religion. And this should not be underestimated. I do not share the nostalgia for the Soviet time, which is now experienced by uh, some people in Russia and which uh, is very often reflected in the uh, contemporary art, in the movies, for example, in TV programs. I still believe that it was a providential event which uh, gave us uh, many new opportunities. The question is, and you are right to pose this question, whether we used all these opportunities. And I believe that we uh, didn't. And I agree with you that uh, it was uh, the West which uh, was not uh, welcoming Russia into its um, uh, cultural, uh, spiritual and political space. Yeah. It was not, uh, there was a point, I remember this, uh, when uh, Yeltsin was uh, the president, and I think in the beginning of the presidency of Mr. Putin, there was a point when uh, there was a serious talk about Russia joining the EU, about Russia joining the NATO, yeah. but this never happened. And then uh, the political development went uh, in a very different direction. Yes. I do feel that the West, you say perhaps Russia, in some ways didn't uh, exploit this time of post-Soviet new freedom, but the West, I think, could have been far more respectful and I would say fraternal because we knew that you had a Western-oriented uh, tradition in music and in art, not Western Orient, a profound human tradition which could be uh, mutually enriching for us. Culturally and intellectually, we are a part of the Western world. We are not Oriental country, though uh, our country is big enough to embrace mm -hmm. both Europe and Asia, but uh, the Russian culture, as it is known in the West, or let's say, as it is known outside of Russia, it is the culture which was formed in Russia. Uh, it was uh, the fruit of the Russian spirit, but it was uh, nurtured by uh, many Western influences. Yeah. And indeed, you can discover this in the Russian music, in the Russian literature, in Dostoevsky, in Tolstoy, in the Russian poetry and uh, in the Russian uh, visual arts. On one occasion, I had a meeting with Joaquin Navarro Valls, who was the spokesman for Pope John Paul II. And I said, what's the center, what's the central idea of his thought, his pontificate? He was Pope from 1978 to 2005. We were speaking right around the year 2000. And he said, it's the anthropological question. What is man? And he said he is very concerned that that 
was given a wrong answer, even if they desired to reach a right answer, the Soviets spoke of the Homo Sovieticus, who no longer has class distinctions and gives his life, in a sense, for the, for the uh, peaceful evolution of a class-free society. But in the West, we were developing this now exasperated post-human, post-soul conception of man. And John Paul was saying, it's turning into a culture of death, not a culture of life. And even today, we have the evolution of this into our reliance and our hope now in artificial intelligence, without any conception of the eternal soul, the logos of God, the adoration of the divine, the concept of the holy. This is gone. We are now embracing, in some way, another type of atheism and another image of what a human being is. And in this process, I feel that the Russian faith and the faith that you have committed your life to and the faith of Christianity in, in the West, even though it is so deeply conflicted now about many things, we have a profound crisis, is the central question of our time. And uh, I wonder if you could reflect on this. As I said, the collapse of the Soviet Union was uh, a providential event which led to many new opportunities. For me personally, uh, it was uh, the opportunity to be exposed uh, to the Western culture and to the Western education. I was uh, one of those uh, few people who were sent for theological studies abroad. And I happened to be in Oxford, in this very traditional and beautiful place of uh, university education. My teacher was uh, a very famous Orthodox theologian, Metropolitan Callistus Ware, with whom we created a very deep and strong friendship until the very end of his life. And uh, he became for me uh, an example of a person who uh, combines a very profound uh, scholarly background with uh, spiritual life. He was both a bishop, though not a diocesan bishop, he was a titular bishop, and he was um, a great scholar. What was also important for me in Oxford that uh, though I studied the Orthodox tradition and the theme of my uh, dissertation was uh, Saint Simeon, the new theologian, and the Orthodox tradition. As I started to write my thesis, <clears throat> I realized that I have to explain my tradition to those who don't belong to this tradition. Because I realized that the readers of my uh, dissertation will be those who know very little about this tradition. And uh, St. Simeon, the new theologian, was um, one of those um, Greek Orthodox saints who are very little known in the West. What were the years of his life? He was born uh, supposedly in 949 and died supposedly in uh, 1022. So there are different chronologies of his life. And that would be the time before the Great Schism in 1054? Yes, when... it was the time before the Great Schism, and he is known for, for his mystical writings. Something uh, similar, though very different, from uh, Western mystics such as uh, San Juan de la Cruz. Uh, and in the scholarly literature, he was presented as a, as a kind of uh, enthusiast, as a mystic, who was not rooted in the Orthodox tradition, but almost rebelled against it, which was not true at all. And I decided that my task was to uh, establish his roots in the Orthodox tradition and to say what was his main sources of inspiration. <laughs> And one of those uh, sources was obviously the New Testament. Another source was the divine worship, 
because he was a monk, so he attended daily worship. And also he was uh, nurtured by some uh, theologians, notably uh, St. Gregory uh, Nazianzen, St. Gregory the theologian, as we call him in the Orthodox tradition. So this led me finally to my uh, second study on St. Gregory. But what was important for me, as I say, is that I had to explain all this to um, the readers who do not belong to the Orthodox tradition. And so I had the privilege of looking at my tradition as it were from outside. And it became uh, for me important because then I used this approach in my other books, in my scholarly studies and in my uh, missionary books, because I realized that uh, most of my readers, many of my readers, are those who, for various reasons, do not belong to my tradition. Okay, this is beautiful, excellent. You were in Oxford in what years? 1993 to 1995. And there is a report that just before that, you were in, I believe, Lithuania, and there was some event in which you displayed great physical courage at the time of the breakup of the Soviet Union. Am I correct? On the 13th of January, 1991, the Soviet troops entered Lithuania. And this was the reaction to the proclamation of uh, the Lithuanian independence. They occupied uh, some parts of Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania, notably the television tower. And uh, there were some protests, some people were killed so it was a very brutal event. And I was at that time uh, in Kaunas, which is the second largest city in this small country. And I happened to know personally many of the Russian militaries who were uh, located there. Because I visited them, I visited military headquarters, I spoke to the soldiers, I spoke to the commanders. And I was told that uh, they will be mobilized in order to take the television tower in Kaunas, yeah. where I was uh, living and where I was dean of the Orthodox Cathedral. So I went on television and I appealed to the Russian soldiers and I said to them that if you receive the order to kill uh, innocent people, do not obey the order. Now, when you spoke those words, were you frightened? I was not frightened at that time, though it was quite risky, of course, because the Soviet Union was still there. Nobody could believe that it would collapse. And so uh, it was risky, but I had no um, choice. It was... Uh, well, you, you were 25 years old, approximately, 66 to 91. 24 at that time. You were 24 years old. You went on the radio. You gave a on talk. On television. On television. Did you consult with anyone before you made that appearance? I didn't. And actually, at that time, I had a very severe pneumonia. Oh. I had a high fever. Uh, I almost had no voice. But still, I produced something so, on television. Would you say... Would it be fair to say that you prayed before you did that? I did, of course. Did you receive strength from the I Holy did. Spirit? Yes, I did. But I didn't consult anyone, so, except for God, of course. Did you realize that you might be reprimanded or even perhaps arrested? Yes, and I was reprimanded. I had After this, I had to change my residence, and I had to leave for several months in a clandestine place because there were many threats. So you went into hiding. So to speak, yes. So we've got two data points that you were kind of rebelling against an ideological spiritual system of atheism which didn't give any horizon toward the eternal for human. It was Darwinian communism and so you became a monk. Yes. Then you did not accept the ordinary process of human power calculation and you said don't kill. Yes. 
And did, you did it at great risk of your personal life. Yes, I did. So, in some way, I, I find in you the spirit of a, of a, I wouldn't say a rebel, but someone who is not, let's say, I use the word perhaps incorrectly, apparatchik. You are not like that. You are referring to the spirit of God and seeking the right path in your life. I was also thinking about uh, real people, not only those who might be killed as a result of this uh, further intervention of the Soviet troops, but also of those soldiers, as I said, whom I knew personally and uh, who uh, may have received orders to kill innocent people. Yeah. So it was though I appealed to them from television, it was a personal appeal. And many of them later came to me uh, and uh, thanked me for this because it was very confusing. Yeah. Well, I remember we visited Moscow with two of my friends in 19, no, 2001 in December after 9-11. And we met you, and we met the now Patriarch Kirill, and Igor Vizhenov was there. There were three Russians, you, Kirill, and Igor, Padre Igor Vizhenov. He was not yet a priest. And I was there, Daniel Schmidt and Frank Shakespeare, the former American ambassador to the Vatican. And then uh, Metropolitan Kirill said, in this room where we are talking, we prevented a civil war in 1993, he said. And I didn't understand that, but from 91 to 93, from this moment in Lithuania until Yeltsin somehow reached an agreement in 1993 not to have a civil war, the fate of Russia was very dangerous, was very much possibly going to descend into a civil war between the communists and then the other forces. And I'm, do you feel there was something miraculous in the fact that you had no major civil war at all after the collapse of an enormous empire like the Soviet Union? I feel that uh, the church played an important role at that moment uh, in trying to bring peace between the uh, parties which seemed to uh, not have a chance to come to agreement. So. And it was uh, the merit of the then Metropolitan Kirill, who was the right hand of uh, the then Patriarch Alexei II. It was Patriarch Alexei II who actually conducted these peace talks, but it was Metropolitan Kirill who was behind it. Just one question, who would have attended such a meeting? Uh, the representatives of the two parties just to explain to our viewers, it was the conflict between uh, the president and the parliament. And it was not just a verbal conflict, it was a conflict which uh, ended up in using tanks and the building of the parliament was shot by tanks. Yes, and some people did die. So, from my perspective, it cannot be explained easily that you did not have a terrible civil war. It's somehow a beautiful moment. I'm always grateful that so many lives were spared because ordinary people would have been caught up. And it is always my position that ordinary people get caught up in something much bigger than themselves yes. and they suffer the consequences. And I am opposed to this. But uh, also I wanted to tell you in Rome, in St. Peter's Basilica, I did not know that there is a tomb of St. Gregory Nazianzus, the theologian who, whose work you studied. And I visited there, I think, in 2016 with uh, the now nuncio in Ukraine, Monsignor Kubalkas. And he said to me, do you realize the Gregory the theologian, the great theologian for the East is buried here? And St. John Chrysostom, he took me. To, and I said, actually, I did not know. I had been in Rome for many years. And then he turns and he says, here also is the tomb of Josaphat, St. Josaphat who died in the early 1600s because he was trying to make some reconciliation between those going over to Rome and those who were staying Orthodox. 
And uh, I, I, I was born on the Feast of St. Joseph at November 12th. So I've always felt that we must do something to overcome these centuries old divisions in our own time. Taking the model really of those meetings in 1993, when there could have been hundreds of thousands of deaths of a civil war and they just made an agreement and stopped. But now this other question of the human soul, if we have no souls, doesn't it say somewhere, if there is no God, then everything is permitted? Isn't there a Dostoevsky, I think, may have said that? This is one of the heroes of Dostoevsky who said this. And uh, it became a very famous uh, phrase, which indeed uh, indicates the mind of Dostoevsky, because he was precisely the one who insisted uh, that uh, if there is no faith, if there is no God, then there are no limits to human freedom, and therefore everything is possible and everything is permissible. And if that is the case, then many cruel things and abominable things are permissible because yes. no one judges it and no one stops it. Only power is the rule. Yes. But the Christian faith believes there is a God. We do not see him, but we believe the universe was not meant to be just cruelty and dead end. And we see that God through the face of Christ. And in your career, you have then moved forward to write about Jesus Christ. In fact, we have a book here that you wrote among many different, six different volumes. Here is Metropolitan Hilarion Alfeyev, The Beginning of the Gospel, Jesus Christ, His Life and Teaching, Volume 1. And in a sense, this becomes the monument of your life, almost like Pope Benedict XVI, who in the middle of his papacy wrote three volumes on Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ becomes, in a sense, the mystery of human nature, human soul, whether we have some eternal destiny or whether we are almost meaningless. Could you reflect on that? First of all, I should say that uh, the book by Pope Benedict XVI was one of the sources of inspiration for me. But I must confess that I didn't read this book before I started MIND. I just received a copy and I started to uh, go over uh, pages, I read some paragraphs, and then it came to my mind that uh, I should actually embark on my own study of Jesus Christ. Because I realized from this uh, initial introduction to the book by Pope Benedict that he was speaking uh, against uh, his background and that he was addressing his audience uh, including those who were uh, contaminated by the so-called critical um, reading of the Gospels. And he was constantly addressing these issues and he was uh, uh, showing in his book what was the position of the Catholic Church. So my idea was uh, to write something about Jesus from the uh, Orthodox position. But I very quickly realized that uh, I should not produce uh, yet another book on Christology, because there are many such books in the Orthodox tradition, but that I actually have to study Jesus Christ as a human being, as a human person, to start from this point. And uh, I restarted to read the Gospel, but not in the way I did it before, but I started to compare all, all the Gospel accounts of a particular episode. I started to read a lot of scholarly literature on the New Testament, which I didn't do before, because before I was specializing in patristic studies. And here I realized that there is a vast uh, field of the New Testament studies. So I embarked on reading uh, these books and articles about Jesus Christ. I began to study all these critical issues around the Gospel and around the text. And I decided that my starting point 
should be uh, Jesus Christ as a human being. Who he was, uh, I start uh, with a very basic question, whether Jesus existed. Because in the Soviet time, many people believed that uh, Jesus didn't exist at all. But and, can you confirm? And in the, uh, did, did he exist? In the 1930s, for example, it was almost the official position yeah. that Jesus Christ didn't exist, that, it was, that he was a literary invention. And I uh, prove in my book that he indeed did exist because uh, there is a lot of evidence about this and uh, probably more than any other hero of uh, ancient history, uh, he is uh, known through uh, the existing evidence. Then I start to discuss what sort of evidence do we have, uh, what are the Gospels, why there are four Gospels and not more, what happened to the apocryphal Gospels. So I discuss all these uh, issues related to Jesus Christ. And I uh, begin with uh, stating that uh, Jesus Christ was the most famous person in the human history. And then I prove it by uh, different facts uh, from his life and from our history. And I also say that uh, in order to understand the Gospels and in order to understand the story of Jesus Christ, we have to use two keys. It's like a safe box which is locked with two keys and you need the two to open it. The first key is to realize that he was a human being, that he was a real man, uh, not different from us in any way except for the fact that he did not have sin. Otherwise, he was a real human being, so his suffering was real, his emotions were real. And this is very important. We should not present him uh, either as a superman or as some other uh, type of uh, being different from the rest of humanity. This is one key. But another key is that he was the incarnate God. And if we do not have this key, again, we cannot disclose the uh, gospel story of Jesus, because if it was just one of the human stories, then, of course, there were similar stories. He was a teacher, but there were many teachers. He was uh, crucified, but there were many others who were crucified. And, uh, for example, after the rebellion of Spartacus, there were uh, 6,000 crosses on the Via Appia. But none of these crosses uh, influenced the human history in the way the cross of Jesus Christ influenced it. Why? because he was not a simple human being, because he was an incarnate God. And then I proceed topically from one volume to another, uh, studying the gospel story and uh, showing how uh, this divinity coincided with humanity in Jesus Christ, in his life and in his teaching, and how with these two keys we can disclose every episode and every story from the Gospel and each saying of Jesus Christ. Well, for 2,000 years now, people have been drawn to Christ. In the Roman Catholic Church, in the Vatican, we have 266 popes. We have never wished to abandon him. We have many human failings, but we still are kind of attracted to this man, this incarnate God, and is that still the case today? Do people still feel they want to understand, they want to see him? In the scriptures, it describes the crowds drawing close to him, trying to touch him. Is this finished now? Is the story of Christ part of our past, a kind of primitive human uh, idealization of a Jewish carpenter, or is it still relevant? 
I think Jesus Christ is still relevant and he will always be relevant. And when I hear uh, some who say that we are living in a post-Christian epoch, I do not believe in this because with my own eyes, I saw the resurrection of faith on such a scale which was unimaginable. As I calculated once and it became uh, a quote, then uh, we uh, built, we opened about a thousand new churches per year, which means about three new churches per day in the Russian Orthodox Church. And I include here not only Russia, but other countries which are under the uh, spiritual jurisdiction of the Russian Orthodox Church. In Russia proper, I think we built uh, two churches per day for the period of 30 years. How can you explain this? It was not uh, the orders coming from the political power. It was not due to the influence of some important speakers. It was Jesus Christ himself who decided to intervene and who decided to reveal himself to my generation. And this is what is uh, most important for me in the whole experience of my life. And this is why I believe also the collapse of the Soviet Union was so important, because it paved the way to Christ, and Christ came to my people and to my nation. Yes. We are in a secular humanistic society, they say. Secular means not sacred. Secular means inside of time, uh, not oriented toward eternity. Secular means everything horizontal, making money, making technology, no thought of God, no thought of anything mystical or transcendent. Secular, humanistic, no thought of divine, only man. This is in a way our prison. We cannot escape it. It's our psychological, intellectual prison. We conceive of everything as secular and humanist. We don't have the concept of the sacred and the divine. Nothing is sacred to us. This is our tragedy. What do you think of our problem? I think if you had an experience similar to mine, living in an atheist country, where religion was practically forbidden, you would probably have a very different attitude to religion now. I am not speaking about you personally, I am speaking about you uh, as representative, let's say, of the uh, Western world and of the culture which you just described. You really need to become very thirsty in order to appreciate the taste of water. If you are not thirsty, it's just water, you don't care. But if you become very thirsty, then uh, water comes uh, as uh, salvation. It comes as something most important in your life. And uh, this is the same with faith. When it is uh, given to you, when it is taken for granted, people don't care. I see that, for example, many people who uh, lived in Russia, uh, they just didn't care about the church. But when they are forced to immigrate for one reason or another, they start to look for their roots and they discover one of our churches here in the West and they start to go to church because uh, they become thirsty for this uh, spirit for spirituality, for religion, for God. We have a lot of talk today about artificial intelligence. It's as if we think this will be a God. This will give us the key to our heart rate, our mind waves, our desires, our fears, and it will kind of give us instructions, perhaps. It doesn't speak of a soul. It doesn't speak of being a person with an eternal dimension. It doesn't speak of spiritual intelligence or wisdom. Are you concerned that a different type of scientific atheism, we might call it, is emerging in the formerly Christian West? 
yes, I am concerned about this and um, I believe that there is nothing which could replace God, even though uh, on many occasions uh, people and political powers tried to find a supplement, like uh, in the time of the French Revolution, for example, or of the Russian Revolution. Uh, if uh, God is taken out of the human life, there is an empty space, and it has to be filled by something or someone. But it is not possible to uh, satisfy the human thirst for truth, for uh, God, for spiritual life, by any uh, such things as uh, the artificial intelligence or as some sort of ideology. And I believe that uh, God himself will continue to fight for human souls. And this is uh, the main source of my hope. I saw how Jesus Christ came to uh, my people. And you know that there is a famous painting by the Russian painter Alexander Ivanov, the uh, coming of Christ to people. And it depicts uh, a group of people who are centered um, around uh, John the Baptist. He is baptizing them. And uh, then they see that Jesus Christ is coming from afar. So his figure is small. You see mostly those figures who are depicted uh, uh, closer to the viewer. But it's uh, a great symbol to me. It's a symbol of what happened to uh, my people. And previously it happened to many other people. And I would like to add to this that when we speak about the West, we also have to make some exceptions. For example, I now live in Hungary, and it's a Christian country. Uh, it doesn't mean that everyone goes to the church here, but there are still many believers. And what is important for me is that the uh, current Hungarian government uh, pays attention to the churches, to religion, to spirituality. They support the churches. And uh, very recently, for example, uh, there was uh, the feast of Saint Stephen of Hungary, the, the first Christian king of Hungary, the baptizer of this country. And uh, traditionally there are uh, fireworks on this day. What happened uh, this August, uh, the fireworks ended up with a huge cross being placed uh, on the sky. Mm -hmm. And it was the Hungarian government which uh, not only didn't prevent this, but I think they initiated this. As I was watching this, I was asking myself whether it would be possible in any other European country or any other European city. And your, your conclusion? And my conclusion was that uh, it wouldn't be possible. Well. We are in a very interesting moment in history. It's 2023. We, uh, we have to end this conversation soon, but I wanted to just ask a couple more questions. We are being told by a number of global leaders that we will have a great reset, so-called, in human economy, in human global trade, in the property, including perhaps the elimination of property. The phrase is, you will own nothing, but you will be happy. This has been stated publicly by people involved in the World Economic Forum. And in this process, we are wondering, are we in the face of a historic transition from one form of economy, maybe we will even regard it as primitive, to some type of computer controlled global economy, but an economy that may do without God, do without Christ, do without the human soul. This 2023, and they've been speaking of this reset for years now, saying it will occur by 2030. Do you think that we should 
keep God and keep Christ at the center of our human adventure? Or should we go with this new technology? I think Jesus Christ uh, remains the same once and forever. And I believe that he will continue to lead our civilization and not the artificial intelligence and not those opinion makers who um, advance various utopian theories. I was a witness of how one utopian theory um, collapsed, how it didn't work in the human life, because they also had the idea that uh, the private property should be abandoned, that everyone should use uh, whatever is available for everyone. And uh, it uh, resulted with repressions, it resulted with uh, millions of uh, innocent people being killed for the sake of this utopian goal. So uh, when I hear about new utopian goals, such as the one you mentioned, I uh, believe that we, uh, we have already seen this. And if uh, some people in the West have not seen this, uh, this is unfortunate. All right, then you can be a witness to something and be a, someone warning the West of the direction we are taking. Yes. You, over the years, as the, uh, the head of the Foreign External Relations Department of the Russian Orthodox Church, you visited Rome. You got to know Pope Benedict XVI and Pope Francis. Can you reflect just for one moment on these experiences to meet the head of the Catholic Church as an Orthodox bishop? I met uh, Pope Benedict six times, and I met Pope Francis uh, 11 or 12 times, and I am mentioning only private audiences, uh, not various other encounters. So I can say that I know both of them personally, and I uh, admired a great deal Pope Benedict XVI for his um, achievements and also for his scholarly work. For me, he was somewhat similar to my Oxford teacher, Metropolitan Callistus, who combined the scholarly work with um, ecclesial uh, work, though of course Metropolitan Callistus was not uh, a pope and was not even a diocesan bishop, so he was more of a scholar than of a pastor, while uh, Pope Benedict uh, became the head of the Catholic Church. Whether he was uh, successful in his role or not, it's not uh, my business, it's the business of the Catholic Church, but my personal relations with him were always uh, very good, very cordial. He actually endorsed uh, this book. He was um, able to read not all six volumes, but uh, the first and the second volumes. And uh, I also met him uh, a couple of times uh, after he retired. And this, these meetings were great experiences. Uh, with Pope Francis, of course, we formed friendship from the very beginning of his pontificate because I attended his enthronement and I met him for the first time on the following day. And to be honest, I was thinking that uh, I will have to explain to him the history of the relations between the Catholic Church and the Russian Orthodox Church, more or less uh, from the scratch. I was thinking that uh, a man who spent most of his life in Argentine, who was never exposed to any Orthodox Catholic official conversations, would not know much about our agenda. And I was quite surprised and astonished by the fact that from the very beginning he exhibited a great knowledge, not only of the Orthodox tradition, but also of the details of um, our bilateral relations. Indeed, he had collaborators, he may have had 
someone who prepared him for this meeting, though I believe that uh, uh, when a meeting takes place on the second day after your enthronement, you don't have much time to do a scholarly work uh, to prepare for such a meeting. So I believe that he knew most of these things already before. And as we continued our conversations over the years, I discovered more and more his uh, appreciation of the Orthodox tradition. And I was uh, very happy to be an instrument uh, in bringing together uh, Pope Francis and Patriarch Kirill, mm -hmm. which was the first uh, ever meeting in the history of our churches when the Pope of Rome and the Patriarch of Moscow met personally. Okay, then finally, given this, wouldn't it be in some way something we could hope for that the relations between the Orthodox world, which are internally now also troubled in some places, but between the Orthodox world and the Catholic world after nearly 1,000 years of division since 1054, that we could overcome this and at least work together on the projects which in our time are so important as we face great challenges. Do you think this is a goal that we should work toward? After more than 20 years of being involved directly in the Orthodox Catholic official dialogues on various levels, I can tell you frankly that I am very pessimistic about the results and I do not expect any great breakthroughs in this field. Which does not mean that we as Christians and as those Christians who belong to the traditional side of Christianity, as those Christians who still believe in the uh, apostolic tradition, in the reality of uh, the presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharistic gifts, in the sacraments, in the church, that we have much in common and that we can do many common projects. This is my belief and this is what we did also with your help and with your participation. And I would like to use this opportunity uh, to thank you for many years of fruitful friendship and cooperation. Thank you, Your Eminence.